Hello, my podcast. Everybody's doing well. After another uh, great weekend uh, here in New Brunswick, uh, the weather in August has just been spectacular. Uh, July was bottom of the barrel when it comes to we get two nice months a year, really. Uh, June, sometimes you can get some nice weather, but July gave us the horns. August has more than made up for it with some excellent weather and uh, been enjoying every bit of it. Um, but over the weekend, I was on here Saturday. There's so much to talk about. And of course, this weekend, uh, we had we had a lot of sports going, a lot of NFL. Also, uh, there was the hurricane, which pushed back uh, a few events. The Boston Red Sox were unable to play yesterday. The New York Yankees did not finish their series with the Minnesota Twins yesterday. The, the golf, the Northern Trust, is currently playing their final round right now. That's the first uh, first first leg, you could say, of the three final events of the of the PGA Tour this season. So uh, I'll keep you guys updated about the leaderboard throughout the show uh, because as of right now, as we said, we have Tony Finau and John Rahm tied for first. Uh, Finau is two under through six holes. Rahm is even through five. Cameron Smith, who shot a 60 on Saturday, is one over through five. So we'll continue to update that through the day. We've seen some good rounds for some people so far. Kevin Na, Alex Noren, uh, Sam Burns has gotten himself back into contention after eight holes, shooting three under. So that'll be um, that'll be talked about today. And I guess so we're going to talk football, tennis, as the U.S. Open is just it starts a week today. So um, really a, a break for most of the big tennis players uh, for to give them a break after two Masters 1000s events right in a row in Toronto and Cincinnati. But I thought we'd start today by talking about baseball. And this weekend, it was Blue Jays, Tigers. And I'm not starting off by talking about the Blue Jays because they're Canadian, you know, Canada's team. As you know, that's not my MO here. I'll talk about the big news. But the big story yesterday was in the sixth inning when Miguel Cabrera hit his 500th career home run and he became the 28th player ever to do so joining, you know, Barry Bonds and Babe Ruth and, uh, you know, just the greats, the great hitters of all time, Mark McGuire. And you could say Cabrera is on a, even shorter list because he's a guy that did it without using steroids. So um, Cabrera is an all-time great. In his peak, he is a two-time Triple Crown winner. You know, with home runs and batting average on base percentage, two seasons in a row. In his heyday for the Detroit Tigers, he was one of the best players in the game. Now, you could argue that okay, well, he played first base. He can't be the best player in in the game. But to me, he as a hitter, there was no one better when he, you know, during his apex. Obviously, Mike Trout is a better baseball player when it comes to his fielding, when it comes to average consistently, and just what he's done cumulatively over the quarter over the course of his career. But that five to six year run, Miguel Cabrera was right there with him, and he was doing it in spectacular fashion, winning MVPs being the face of the Detroit Tigers, um, leading that team to the World Series in 2012 alongside Justin Verlander. They ultimately came up short, but it was a, a great run where you saw you know, David Price was on that team, Justin Verlander, Miguel Cabrera, Victor Martinez. They had a very good team, and they were close to winning that World Series title. And for the last number of years, Cabrera has gotten old. Father time has you know, hurt him. He's not the same player that he used to be. He doesn't play first base all the time. He's primarily a designated hitter now. That's something Detroit has done. Victor Martinez was a great player for the Red Sox and Tigers briefly, uh, but then he really hurt his back, became a primary DH. He did that for the final three seasons of his career. Manuel Cabrera is an elder statesman on a team that is in a rebuild. However, the Detroit Tigers are 
something that I what I like they're that they're doing. Again, I don't watch the Tigers a ton because you know they're they are six games below five hundred. But we are what they're what they do well is they're a scrappy bunch. They got some veterans in Cabrera, and you look at their staff; it's quite young. Uh, they don't have. We saw Drew Hutchinson pitch pitch yesterday for the Tigers. We've seen, um, you know, Ma- Madison Fulmer, who who is a more experienced pitcher. So they do have some experienced guys, uh, but they're playing younger guys. And Zach Short at shortstop. We're seeing Yamir Candelario, who they want to be that first, uh, that third baseman of the future. We'll see. They've parted with Nick Castellanos. Victor Martinez is gone. Chris Archer was on this team. He's since gone. So they're going through a shift in their organization and how they do business, but they've gotten better faster than some other teams. And I give them credit for that because you look at the Tigers and compare them to the Baltimore Orioles. The Tigers have been very bad for a number of seasons. Yes, they're going to miss the playoffs this year again by a long shot, but you're starting to see strides. Again, they're 60 and 66, six games below 500. They will finish below 500 by the end of the season, no doubt. But at least you see competitive baseball. This weekend, they took two of three from the Toronto Blue Jays. The Blue Jays are desperate to get wins. They are in a wild card race where wins are at a premium. And the Tigers took two of three. Not only that, they win both of their games in extra innings. That's a clutch, big hitting that we see. They've got Soto, a closer that I think can be a closer of the future. So they have building blocks is all I'm saying. Gregory Soto, he gets the win both Friday and Sunday in a closer role. Now six and three on the season. But I like some of what they've done. And I give them credit for at least putting a competitive team out there. Juxtaposing the Tigers to the Baltimore Orioles, the Baltimore Orioles have been a disaster have been a disaster for a number of years. They had Chris Davis, who hit 50 plus home runs one year, nearly won the MVP. He was the you know the face of that team. And they had Darren O'Day in the bullpen. And they had um, Jimenez pitching. And they, they had a team that competed for the playoffs every year. The American League East, you think it's competitive now. Back in the day, you had the Red Sox, Yankees, Jays, and Orioles that were all very good. And the Rays were the, the back of the pack. Now the Rays have surpassed all of those teams in quick order. But Chris Davis left, and we see O'Day depart, and they've traded off every player that was of any value. The Baltimore Orioles have lost 18 games in a row. 18 games. And during that span, they have a negative 108 run differential. There's losing. Then there's just getting your ass kicked. Both That happens to Baltimore all the time because they're so pathetic. And you look at them. They are 38 and 85. I'm pretty sure I could get a ragtag bag, you know, a bunch of buddies and go 38 and 85. That's how bad this Baltimore team is. You know, Buff- the Buffalo Sabres get rid of They stink. And Arizona, they don't even have a rank. They stink. But Baltimore is so, is such a disaster. And you look at the Tigers who have been terrible. They're starting to turn around. The Cincinnati Reds, the best two, they were a joke for a long time. They make the playoffs last year. They're going to make the playoffs again this year. You look at the Chicago White Sox, quick order, getting better. The Mariners are at least competitive. They win yesterday against the Astros in extras. They're nine games above 500. So there's trying to be competitive, and then there's just embarrassing levels of ineptitude, and Baltimore has a master's degree in that. So Miguel Cabrera gets his big day. And I I want to take the Tigers angle for a little bit. However, that brings us back to the Blue Jays. And because we're talking about Cabrera and that series, I'll touch on the Blue Jays. You Friday night, you got a lead in the eighth inning. 
and you're playing the Tigers. I just propped up the Tigers a little bit. However, you're playing the Tigers. This late in the season, it's a luxury to play the Tigers. The Oakland Athletics this past weekend played the San Francisco Giants. That is not a luxury. That is a detriment because that team just finds ways to win. They win in clutch situations. You know, I'd much rather play the Tigers, and yet the same result. Giants took two or three from Oakland. The Tigers take two of three from the Blue Jays. So Friday night, you got a lead and a solid outing. Starting pitching for the Blue Jays lately has not been the issue. Manoa struggled last week. He got blown up. But he's a young pitcher. That's going to happen. It was in Washington. Other than even Steven Matz, who I believe is their worst starter, has been pretty damn consistent lately. But you have a day. It's going pretty well. And Robbie Ray goes eight innings, only gives up one earned run. 11 strikeouts he was dealing. You give up one earned run over eight, should be enough to win. But bats were cold. They were all weekend. They have been for a week and change now. And then you look at just the ineptitude. Fly ball to right field. Loris Gurriel Jr. It's a simple play. Make the catch in right heat and left. He drops the ball. Runners advance. Tigers ended up putting four in the top of the 10th. Sorry, three in the top of the 10th. They take it 4-1. Can't happen. Trevor Richards gets the loss, but I look at Loris Goriel as the main culprit. Then they win Saturday. Way to go. We get to Sunday. You're up in the ninth. You know, this is so frustrating. You know, if I'm if I was a Blue Jays fan, this would be so, so frustrating. But bottom of the eighth, Loris Goriel Jr. redeems himself, hits a single. You're up 2-1. You go into the ninth. Think, okay, we got our closer. We got this, right? Like, this is this is a wrap. Until, you know, it's going well. You got, you know, they didn't put Romano out because he had pitched two days in a row. But you had Mats and you had Thornton, who was good. You had Richards. Adam Simber comes on the mound, allows a few guys on. But then Marcus Simeon, air at second base. Ties the game. We go in extras. You, you tie it up in the bottom of the 10th, but then the top of the 11th, Kyle Sneed gets blown up for two earned runs, and you lose the game. So two errors essentially cost this team two wins. This You could look at the bullpen this weekend, when the bullpen has been a massive problem for the Blue Jays. In innings one to six, the Blue Jays have a top Five ERA in the American League. Inning seven to nine, they are the second worst earns has the second worst earn run average in in American League. That tells you everything you need to know. Their bullpen stinks, but getting one run is not sufficient either. Friday night, one run. That's all you were able to put up against the Detroit Tigers. That can't happen. Yesterday, 2-1. You got a good performance from Steven Matz. Bullpen's going pretty well. You need to put up more than two runs. And, you know, Vlad Guerrero Jr. is ice cold. He walked twice yesterday, which good at bats, but he needs to pick it up. This team has been Tiosca Hernandez or bust lately. The guy's been red hot. We've seen a good game from Bichette yesterday. He goes three for six. But otherwise, it's been just guys not delivering. Kritchik, stop hitting into double plays. I think the guy gets a bonus in his salary when he hits into a double play. He does it constantly. And that's the problem with hitting in, in, in the major leagues now. Kritchik is a guy that will swing for a home run all the time. This guy's either hitting a home run or he's hitting a ground ball. So it's very easy for an infielder to say, okay, ground ball, move in. If he hits it over the wall, eh, we'll take our chances. But when he doesn't, 
you know it's going to the left side. It's going to the third baseman. He throws it to short. And ring him up. It's over. Double play. He's not beating on anybody running. And I, I just look at this, and they got the White Sox now for four this week. That's not an easy series. You just blew two, two games against the Nationals. You lose two or three to the Tigers. Your opportunities are slipping away. Because today, the Red Sox are beating the Texas Rangers. That's a team you're chasing. They lead 3-1, top of the eighth, one out. So you're, you're chasing them. You need to catch them. In the wild card race right now, the Blue Jays are four and a half back. Seattle is three games. Seattle's a game and a half ahead of, of the Blue Jays. Oakland and Boston are tied at 70 and 55. The, the New York Yankees are, are just cruising at this point. They seem like they're going to be the first wild card for sure. Insurmountable. You know, they, they are actually now only four and a half back of Tampa Bay. So they can make it interesting in the divisional race where they've just been smashing all over the yard and the bats will go cold. They, they won't be swinging the bats like they have been all year, but it's work for them. And this brings me back to my point. It was only last, I believe it was last Monday where everybody was saying, oh, this team reminds me a whole lot of the 2015 Blue Jays. And my thought was pump the brakes. I, they didn't remind me a thing of the, of the 2015 Blue Jays. They beat the Kansas City Royals. Okay, you crush Kansas City. Great. Kansas City is a bottom three team in the major leagues. You should crush Kansas City. They're terrible. It's like beating Buffalo in the NHL. It's like beating the Houston Texans this year in the NFL. It's not an accomplishment. That's something you should do. Like, I would, this is my example. I remember growing up, my mother always said, Noah, make your bed. And she never gave me credit for doing it. I rarely did it, to be fair. But you don't get credit. You shouldn't get adulation for doing something that's just, that, that you need, it is necessary. You don't get a pat in the back for taking your dog outside to go pee. What's the alternative? He pees on your carpet, pees on your floor. You have to go clean it up. Same thing here. Toronto Blue Jays blow out Kansas City. That's what should happen. But when you play the Tigers and you play the Nationals and it's the same exact story and you should beat this team, you're going to take criticism for doing it. My mother would get mad when my bed wasn't made and I have to figure out ways to avoid Work around that. Shut my door. You know, put a lock on it. When I was younger. And that, and that brings us to this series where you're playing the White Sox. They're one of the best teams in baseball, period. Their bats are elite. I have faith in this starting pitching. Hyunjin Ryu pitched really well on Saturday. Against, against, against the Tigers, but body work lately, he pitched very well. Steven Matz has been good. Manoa will return to the mound tonight. He had, His last start was rough, but he's got the stuff. He can pitch well tonight. But to me, this series, this next stretch is about the bats of the Toronto Blue Jays. Okay, you want to be known as the 2015 team? You want to have those same sort of expectations? Yes, Toronto media types will talk about that. But I don't give a shit about Toronto media types. I give a crap about me and what I see in front of me. I don't prop teams up just because I'm in a market. I'm, I'm not. I'm, in, I'm an independent. Uh, and looking at this, the Toronto Blue Jays, this is the make or break series, in my opinion. Big series this week, Oakland plays Seattle. That's a huge series. Yankees play the Braves. That's another big one. But you're, you got to catch Boston or Oakland first. But you need to send a message here. This can't be a two and two series. It has, it has to be three wins for the Blue Jays this week, in my humble opinion. Talk about how home field is such a big, you know, such a, a big deal. And the, the Raptors complained about playing in Tampa and how that was such a detriment to their season. Well, you're at home, and there's fans in the building. 
And what else do you need? They're excited to get down to the park. They haven't been able to in forever. Play for your fans if that's what you need to do. But this series, it needs to be three wins for the Blue Jays. The White Sox aren't going to make it easy. They don't have as much to play for because they're going to they're cruising to a division title because they have no competition. The Tigers, Cleveland, um, since uh, Kansas City, they're not catching them. However, they do want to finish first in the American League. You have the best record in the American League at the end of the year. The playoffs through the American League go through you. You'd host Tampa Bay. You'd host the first the wild card team that comes out. You have a more favorable schedule. That's something to play for. They also got a, a veteran manager that's not going to let this team mail it in already in late August. They're playing tough. Tony Larusa is going to make his team play tough throughout this entire season. And this is a make or break series for the Toronto Blue Jays, where go go out there and win or shut up. And that it'll it'll make the Toronto media shut up because Toronto media is, is a machine where when you're doing things really well, they're, they're a sounding board. And even when you're still in the hunt, they really prop you up and they feed into it and say, well, they went through a tough stretch, but you know, Joe Siddle and Jamie Campbell, oh, they're going through a tough stretch, but the bats are going to come alive here, Joe. And, you know, they're, they'll make it. Same with the Leafs. If they're still in a playoff hunt, well, they're just going through a skid. Well, they're up 3-1, but it's game seven at home. I feel good about Toronto's chances. Then, when, when you're finally out, that's when shit hits the fan and all hell breaks loose. And they turn on the team. Until that team is done. Till the 18 wheeler is off the road, they will pump the tires, which I think hurts some of these Toronto sports franchises. I think it does Toronto no favors. None over the years. I don't think the media has helped that team whatsoever because it props and gives fans bad narratives that they that their team is better than what they truly are. Like I true. If there's fans out there, let me know because I'd love to have a conversation with you. I think there's people that think if Toronto defeated Montreal, they would have beaten Tampa in a seven-game series. That they would have beaten Vegas in a seven-game series. If there are fans out there that really think that, please send me a text. and Let's have a conversation, and I'll tell you why you're wrong. But I think it's not your fault. The Toronto media telling you that a team that never wins anything is going to win. But the media is, it's like a real, it's like a parent that has over, has too much expectations for a kid that has little to no talent. It's it's that parent says, oh, my kids, you know, plays all this hockey and he's going to make it to the NHL. Okay. Good pipe dream. But then when your kid gets out there and he can't do a C-cut, well, then you're putting expectations on your child that are ridiculous. Maybe it's just, well, I always want my kid to have fun. That's the expectation. Not my son's going to the NHL, yet he's looking up in the stands and he wants to go play video games. And I think the media has does the same thing where they push a team that is uh, mediocre to average and they try to prop them up to being above average to a superior team. Now the blue Jays can validate that argument that the media is making. However, If they don't, then it's just the same cycle that we see with the Raptors, that we see with the Leafs, to a lesser extent, the Argos. In 2019, the Raptors validated it. They won a title. Since then, this core of Raptors teams 
you know, finally when they decided to to tank this year, it was like, okay, this team really isn't that good anymore. That's the only time they really truly accepted that. And I just, I worry about that. But a huge series starts tonight, Blue Jays, White Sox. This series will tell us what the Blue Jays are made of. Come the last game of this series Thursday afternoon around four o'clock, we'll know what this team is made of then and where the trajectory of this team's going. Because if they lose three or four, they're likely done. Even though they play the Twins a lot down the stretch, even if they play the Orioles, I believe, 10 more times or something crazy like that, it's going to be really tough to make up games because even if you're playing those really poor teams, teams ahead of you aren't losing every game either. So when you get a win and, and then the team you're chasing gets a win, gets a that's a wash. You don't move ahead any. So we'll see what the Blue Jays are made of, but um, interesting for sure down the stretch here. Another interesting pivot is the National League wild card. For the longest time, it looked like it was going to be three teams of the National League West that were going to make the playoffs. The San Francisco Giants, who have held the first place crown for multiple months now. The Los Angeles Dodgers, who have been cruising to a wild card spot, still in a deep comp, uh, competition for that uh, NL West title. And the San Diego Padres, for a long time, were involved. They had a great staff and Joe Musgrove and Ryan Weathers and Hugh Darvish and uh, they uh, Dylan uh, Lamlet. And it looked like this team was going to be going to go to the playoffs for the second straight season. But then a couple things happened. Number one, Fernando Tatis Jr. The third started to get injured. Uh, and he's maybe the most electrifying player in baseball. He's my favorite player to watch. He will make me sit down and watch an entire Padres game because he's that damn good. He's that special. So that was a tough, it's tough to lose that bat in your lineup. But the biggest problem, and we see this, you can be a really great player like Mike Trout, like Shohei Otani, but if your team doesn't have pitching, you're screwed. And midway through this season, I'm sure you recall, Major League Baseball announced that they are going to stop pitchers from using the sticky stuff, aka it could be suntan lotion or different creams to help them with their grip, with velocity. And since this has happened, We've seen a lot of pitchers struggle. Think of Garrett Cole in New York. He went through a very tough stretch. Uh, he, he was very public, you know, having an interview, and he basically ducked the question, and it came out very awkward, and it seemed very transparent to me anyway that Garrett Cole was a frequent user of the sticky stuff, and it benefited him greatly. Yet he never cheated in Houston. He wasn't involved in the cheating scandal. I digress. Uh, but a team I think that was using the sticky stuff quite a bit was the San Diego Padres. You looked at you, Darvish. Through half, midway through June, the guy had a 211 earn run average, was dominating baseball. He's a great pitcher, or he was, and he looked like he was. And back to his old form where he was the man. You look at Blake Snell last year, pitching in the World Series, goes seven innings, gets pulled out of a start by Kevin Cash. Then they, he's irate. They lose the game to the Dodgers in game six. They lose the World Series. Blake Snell this year, former Cy Young winner, has a 482 earn run average. Now, just for everybody's sake, it's not good. No, that's it's, it's not good. Um, he's only pitched 106 innings. He's got a 6-5 and five record. It's not that good. You know, that's not, that's, not, that's not a great record to have. You don't want that record. So he's been less than ideal. His play this year has been mediocre at best. And Weathers had a 230 ERA. It has risen to 350. 
Lamlet has gotten injured because he said he can't find his grip. Funny that you can't find your grip. I wonder why. Maybe because you don't got the sticky stuff anymore. But now you got you Darvish, who's on the injury list. Like I just, like I mentioned, he was pitching so well. But now it's a nightmare in San Diego. Last week, they get swept by the Colorado Rockies. The Colorado Rockies are not a good team, for the record. They are second to last in the National League West, just ahead of the Diamondbacks, who are terrible. So you get swept by the Rockies. Then you return home, you lose two or three to the Philadelphia Phillies. The Phillies are in the race for the National League East. They've been struggling as well, but Padres lose two or three to them. The previous week, they lost two or three. They should already lost three or four to the Arizona Diamondbacks. So this just tells you what kind of spiral this team is on, including getting no hit against those Diamondbacks. Meanwhile, the Cincinnati Reds have gone on a tear. After being after a week and a half ago, they were four and a half back of the second wild card spot. After winning yesterday against the Miami Marlins, they are now one game ahead of the Padres in the wild card race. They are now in sole possession of that second wild card spot, trailing the Dodgers by eight and a half games. But San Diego is now on the outside looking in. They traded for Adam Frazier. They acquired Hugh Darvish. They've got Mike Clevenger in the offseason. And now they are in a desperate position where they may miss the playoffs after Fernando Tatis Jr. the third got a $300 million 13-year contract. And it's a bad time right now to be a San Diego Padre fan. But for Cincinnati, a team that's been, it's been, it's been a minute since this team's really been competitive. Last year, they made the playoffs, but it was expanded playoffs. They had Trevor Bauer, who won the Cy Young Award for them. But they were never really a threat. They were never going to, to do anything in the playoffs. And maybe the same, it's the same this year. But one person who has been a rock star lately is Canadian first baseman, Joey Votto. Last week, he became the second Canadian to Larry Walker to get 2,000 hits. This year, he's batting 270. He's got over 20 home runs, and it sure looks like he is now the front runner to win the National League MVP. Now, it's not all about Joey Votto, but he's hitting 280 now, 28 homers, 81 RBIs, and he's getting on base. That's his big thing. See, this weekend, two walks, one walk. One, the guy is getting walks. He's doing it all. He's scoring runs. And at his age of 37, 15 years, all played in Cincinnati, this guy is the real deal. And I, I just look at him. I look at guys like Tyler Naquin, who was never on anybody's radar. Nick Castellanos, who's been a really good player, who's a third baseman converted to right field. He was a guy in Detroit that they liked, but they didn't see him as a, as a fit. They've since moved on from him. He's been a rock star in Cincinnati. He's got a ton of personality, not afraid to mix it up. He's batting 319 this year, 22 homers, seven, 70 RBIs, and he's He's been great. Um, so this team has just got a lot of good, you know, a lot of good going for it. And it's going to, it's another interesting race down the stretch here where can Cincinnati keep this wave going? Look this week, Cincinnati will be playing Milwaukee. It's a tough matchup in Milwaukee division, division uh, battle, but the Padres are playing the Dodgers. So we got two big divisional uh, games this week, two divisional series where it's desperation for both. Milwaukee will cruise to that National League West or National League Central title. The Dodgers are like, you know, they're still in the hunt for the National League West. They're two and a half back of the San Francisco Giants, who this week will head to New York to play the Mets. But it, it's going to be a battle throughout the end of this season to see who can get 
that spot. But it's super interesting to see what can happen. You know, the, the, the Rays had such a lead in the American League East. It's only four and a half now. I know they're still playing good baseball. They took two of three from the Chicago White Sox. But things can happen. A few breaks go your way, and then you're you're looking at it saying, holy crap, look what happened here. And you, you even look at the National League East. The New York Mets were in such a prime position. It looked like finally their, their problems were over. Steve Cohen had bought the team. They got Frankie Lindor. They traded for Almago and Javier Baez. And this team was on the right path. Now they are five games out of a wild card and they are seven games back of the division. The Atlanta Braves have just gone on a tear lately. They're without Ron Acuna Jr., one of the top 10 best players in baseball. He's out with a torn ACL. They're without starting left field, left fielder Marcelo Zuna, but they're finding ways to win. Freddie Freeman, Ozzy Albies is having a spectacular season. I think he's emerging in the MVP discussion as well. But Phillies dropped off. You know, they look like they were going to win the division for a while. They do. They have the easiest schedule remaining in Major League Baseball due to the Phillies. Uh, Braves don't have as easy. They got the Yankees this week, while the Philadelphia Phillies this week will be playing. Let me find it here for everybody. The Phillies will play. Where are the stupid Phillies? They'll play Tampa, Tampa Bay's not an easy series this week. So they, they both got difficult series, but upcoming, they do have the easiest stretch. I mean, they got the Diamondbacks this weekend while the Braves have San Francisco. That just tells you that I believe the Braves also got to go to Los Angeles. So that's still, that's still a battle for sure to see who will uh, come out of the National League East. But it, this baseball season has been crazy. It's been a back and forth affair. Things are mixing up. Giants and Dodgers are still very much a battle where the Giants are holding them off, but the Dodgers, Cody Bellinger's finding his game again. Kenley Jansen's restored um, his pitching. Trey Turner has been a great leadoff hitter for the Dodgers since being acquired with Max Scherzer. So we'll wait and see, but it, you know, baseball is interesting right now. And we got about a month and change left. So a month until the around. 40 days until the playoffs start where there's only 40 games or less for all these teams. They need to find ways to get wins. And whether it's the Blue Jays who are focused in Canada or the Mets and Phillies uh, in, in the National League or San Diego, it's going to be a battle. And it's going to be desperate times for, where players need to step up and, and put their imprint on the season on their team, or they're going to be out on the outside looking in thinking, where did we go wrong here? So, We'll see what happens, but uh, interesting nonetheless that um, baseball is in full swing. Uh, we'll see if the Red Sox can find their way and if the Athletics can, can, can continue to play good ball, whether the Yankees can you know have a, a season that looked like a disaster and Cashman can get the team into the playoffs uh, nonetheless. So we'll keep an eye on everything and uh, some interesting series this week in, in baseball. So we'll touch on that throughout the week as well. I mentioned off the top of the show, I'll keep you guys up to date with the results here at the Northern Trust, the first first event of the playoff. And looks as though John Rahm has uh, has the solo lead right now. Through six holes, he is one under. He's got 17 under for the tournament. Eric Van Royen of South Africa and Tony Finau are tied for second at 16 under, followed by Cam Smith and then Shane Lowry. The, uh, the Irishman is um, at 14 under. So an interesting battle for sure here. We got Tom Hogue followed Sam Burns, Keegan Bradley, Kevin Na, Corey Connors, the Canadian is tied for 11th at 12 under. He's even through eight holes. So still a, a lot of golf to play, but they couldn't play yesterday because the hurricane, like I said, but Saturday it was, it was a day that, you know, it's called moving day. And it was because we saw a lot of guys rise up. Cameron Smith, who has been really a guy at the majors. He nearly won Augusta this past year. He's always competitive. He shot a 60. He had a putt uh, for birdie on 18. That would have been a course record 59 to go 12 under for the day. But, you know, he skyrocketed up the standings and entered today with a tie with a share of the lead, 
with John Rom. John Rom started eight under, then went to four under, and then was two under on Saturday. So his play has been dipping every day. But it, it's been interesting because you see, you know, only the top 70 advanced. So a lot of guys today are just playing to make it to next week. And, you know, to be involved in that top 70 and then work from there. A guy like Tom Hogue started this week ranked 104. He has now crept into the top, I think he's 65th as he sits right now. So he will be eligible to play next week at the, this week, sorry, Thursday, it'll start Thursday at the BMW. So, um, it, you know, I, obviously John Rahm is the best player in the world. Morikawa was first in FedEx cup standings. He missed the cut this week. He'll still be playing next week at the BMW because of his season. Uh, and he won't lose that many ranking points, even though he's missed the cut here at the first playoff um, tournament. But uh, interesting nonetheless. Um, we'll see what I, I'll keep you guys up to date as we go here. But for John Rom, it would be big to win this week. No, no, no doubt. You know, he's oh, we just got through seven. He just got through his seventh hole. He's still seventeen under. Finau bogeyed. He threw eight. He's fifteen under. Cam Smith's fifteen under. Ben Royan bo just bogeyed on seven. He's fifteen under. Shane Lowry is at fourteen. Nah, Norin, Keegan Bradley. Sam Burns, Tom Hogue, and Justin Thomas are all at 13 under par. So uh, in interesting as we, as we get through Mackenzie Hughes, the Canadian is at eight under. He's got three holes left on the day. Victor Hovland, who was in good shape to start, he's six over through nine holes. So that's a tough one. Kepka is eight under, three under through three over through 10. So some guys are struggling. Uh, they got a lot of rain overnight. So it's not, hasn't been the greatest conditions at the uh, Liberty golf course in New York, but um, we'll see what happens. Uh, I think I like the new setup for, for golf. I mentioned that last week. I don't love that. It's really hard for the 30th ranked players, basically impossible for that player to win the last leg of, of this, of the FedEx cup playoffs. But I do like that. You get there, you you get to play at, at the majors in the coming years, and you do get rewarded for your solid play. But I do wish they did something that was more fair for players that you don't start the last, like, 10 strokes off the lead. I mean, there's no way you're going to win that tournament. Somebody in the top five is more than likely going to win the event. So I do think that they can make some tweaks to make this make this better, make it more competitive, and that it's not just four or five guys at the end of the week. But – you know, John Rahm to me is the best player in the world. And he finished second in the FedEx Cup standings last year. After this year, you'd think, well, there's no way he's going to finish first after all that he's been through when it comes to the memorial and then having COVID twice. But it would be such a COVID event if he does somehow find a way to not only win today at the Northern Trust, but then pull it out um, in a couple of weeks at the tour championship, obviously a ways to go before that he'll have some good competition at the, at the top of that leaderboard, you know, seeing Justin Thomas play well this week uh, should spark some interest in some people to see if he can keep that going. If he can play consistently like that down the stretch here, but um, interesting nonetheless, well, I'll, like I said, as, as this podcast keeps going, especially at the end, I'll update you guys on where everybody sits, but it's golf. Golf is always interesting because, but there's so many good players right now that I think I just think it's so so interesting to look at everybody and how they're doing, and it's just it's honestly just interesting to see who makes the cut, who gets to play next week, then who doesn't because uh, it some of those guys that creep in it means a lot to their career. Where a guy like John Rom, you know he's going to have his tour card because he just won a major this year, so it for him it's a big deal you know, the $15 million, he's not going to turn that down. But for somebody like Tom Hogue or Kevin Na, a veteran, getting to these later tournaments gets you into majors next year, gets you into bigger events, and it keeps your name on the on the golf map. So that that's really what some of these guys are fighting for in these last couple of holes today. Get some birdies, creep into that top 70, then you get in a flight and you go to the BMW next week, and then you hope you can creep into the top 30 um, starting Thursday. Um, as well. Um, tennis. I mentioned off the top that the U.S. Open starts a week 
today. Uh, August 30th is the start of this tournament. We go from the 30th past Labor Day, and it's over on the 12th of September. And we already know we're going to be missing some big names. Uh, we're not going to see Dominic Team. We're not going to see Rafael Nadal. We're not going to see Roger Federer. However, we are we are going to see Novak Djokovic on the men's draw. And he's obviously a big name. We're going to see Sasha Zverev, Stefano Sissipas. Uh, you're going to see Daniel Medvedev. But for the women's draw, what's really evident to me is that Ash Barty is just you know, signaling her dominance in the women's draw where she won Wimbledon and she decided not to compete at the Olympics, but this is her first big event since. And she went through the entire Cincinnati event with only losing one set. She was dominant. She built, she beats uh, Jill Teichman of Switzerland, six, three, six, two in the final. It really was not that competitive. Teichman had a great tournament beating her fellow country women, country woman, sorry, Belinda Bencic. She beat Carolina Pliskova, the uh, last week's finalist at the Rogers Cup in the semifinal. She had a great run, but Barty is just, she's so consistent. The best thing about Barty is that she puts balls in play. She makes women make an extra shot. And what that does is it, it creates an opportunity for them to hit an error, or she puts in enough location where you have to hit one down the line and they miss it. And I, she doesn't have the greatest power, but her serve, she can place it very well so that her ace count will rise without having the biggest power. But she, her, she's great at finding angles and making it difficult on opponents. And just looking at this, Simona Halep is not going to be 100%. She had to pull out of Cincinnati before a second round match. She's played just four matches this year. I'd be surprised if she goes on a deep run at the U.S. Open and her court is by far her worst surface. Push give up. Pushko's played good tennis this year. She made the final at Wimbledon. She made the final at the Rogers Cup semifinal in Cincinnati. But she's not a closer. She's been to two major finals. She's lost both of them. She's had leads in both of them. And I just look at her and say, I don't trust her to beat Barty. She just lost to Barty. And I, I, I just, I don't think she's a legitimate threat. Uh, Victoria Azarenka. Azarenka is not what she used to be. She's aging. Uh, she's you know, she, when she, she's competitive, but I, she has won the U.S. Open, but I don't see her being a huge threat. Then there's Petra Kvitova. Kvitova is, the thing with Kvitova, she's so frustrating. When she's playing great tennis, she's one of the best women's players in the world consistently. But more often than not, she's just, when she's off her A game, it's really bad and it gets ugly for her. And we've seen that happen. Or you look at her and say, you watch her first set. She wins at 6-1. You're like, okay, this is going to be Kvitova. She's going to cruise. Then you you know, go make popcorn. You come back in 10 minutes, and she's down for four love in the second set. And then the third set, she doesn't have the firepower to rebound, especially on the hard court where grass is her specialty. That's where she's won both of her majors. So just going off her prior performances at the Open and what I know about her, I don't see her as a, as a major threat. Then there's the obvious Serena Williams. Serena Williams hasn't played tennis since Wimbledon competitively. And I look at that and say, well, she's 40 years old. She hasn't played since early July. How is she going to look at the U.S. Open? When she hasn't played good tennis in a very long time. And she, like Roger Federer, she's not a contender anymore. Whenever Roger Federer enters a major, I don't just, I don't expect him to win. To be honest, I don't expect him to get to a quarterfinal or a semifinal. He's not that player anymore. He used to be the prohibitive favorite. Serena Williams, like Roger Federer, is not the prohibitive favorite anymore. And it might be hard to hear that as a fan and stomach it, but it's just the truth. Things happen. Father's time's undefeated. You're not going to beat everyone forever. And I think that's what's happening with Serena and Serena Williams with Roger Federer, potentially with Rafael Nadal as he goes through this foot injury. So just naming off a few of those women, who is Ash Barty's biggest competition? And, you know, going through that, you think, well, it's going to be a cakewalk. But the most interesting thing about the women's game is that 
an unranked player can can win an event. It never happens in the men's game. An unranked man is never going to win. You know, I I could name the last unseeded player to win a major. The closest I can think of that got close is Robin Soderling. He lost to Nova, he lost to Roger Federer in the 2009 French Open. He was unranked. I think he was 75th in the world at the time. He beat Rafael Nadal in maybe the biggest upset in the history of tennis in the fourth round in straight sets. But he didn't win. He lost to Federer in straight sets in the final. So, you know, Elena Ostapenko, Barbara Krecheva, Pavla Ochenkova, these all these women were unranked. Svetlana Kuznetsova was an unranked woman who won a major. Uh, Roberta Vinci. These unranked women, sometimes a wild card in the tournament, have won major championships. They may never get back to a semifinal, but they can win it on a given week. And I think through this process and through this past year, Ash Barty has earned the right to be the prohibitive favorite. She's won two majors now. She's number one in the world. She carries herself very well, and she's playing the best tennis of her life. No question. However, she does not get the same confidence meter. She does not have the same respect as a Novak Djokovic. No, Novak Djokovic has 20 majors. He's won all three this year. He's beaten, you name him. He beat Medvedev in Australia. He beat Tsitsipas in Roland Garros. He beat Matteo Berrettini at Wimbledon. Three different men hoping to break through to get past the big three, so to speak, as Djokovic is representing you know, the big three uh, with, with Federer and Nadal in, the, in this case. None of them have. Tsitsipas was the closest. Medvedev didn't even win a set in Australia. Berrettini took the first set at Wimbledon, but they haven't been able to break through that shield. And as we look ahead to next week, I don't care who's in his draw, Novak Djokovic will be the massive betting favorite in Vegas. I believe Ash Barty will be the betting favorite in Vegas for the women, but it shouldn't be at the same level because Djokovic has just done it longer. And again, we don't see those major upsets in tennis where Djokovic was kicked out of the U.S. Open last year because he hit a ball woman. And it was, that was, it was a rule. I didn't agree with it. And to be honest, I don't, I don't like Djokovic at all. I think he's got the personality of a stale hot dog bun. Uh, I think a lot of his mannerisms on the court are that of an egomaniac and somebody that's really self-absorbed and for, for lack of a better term, a little man. But I can't take away what he's done in the sport he will go down as the greatest tennis player of all time, more than likely, man or woman. I would still put Serena there for me because what she did um, during a whole generation was unparalleled. Djokovic, it took him a while to beat Federer, beat Nadal. And when he figured it out, he did it very effectively. But what Serena did to the entire women's field it's pretty incredible. But, you know, Sasha Zverev has beaten Djokovic at the Olympics. He beat him in the semifinal. Can he do it again? You know, we see Sh- Sasha, he wins this past weekend in Cincinnati. He had to go through Sissy Pass to do it. Was down uh, 4-2 in the third set. It looked ugly for a while. Um, but he gets, he gets the break back. So he's down 5-2, broke twice then wins the match on a tie break showing a lot more fight from Sasha than in past years where in the past, he would have just gave up on that match. He would have lost his temper and it would have been a disaster for him, but he didn't. He stayed in the moment. So can he, he beat him at the Olympics. Can he beat him at the open? Zverev made the U S open final last year, losing the Dominic team, which is still such an upset to me because team is not a very good hardcore player. He's not going to be in this. He's not going to be able to defend his title. He's injured. He's got having shoulder surgery. He's still recovering. Can he do it? I mentioned Berrettini. Berrettini played really well on, on grass. He, prior to Wimbledon, his, far, his deepest run was at the U.S. Open two years ago where he made the semifinal. Can he get back and get another opportunity at Novak? 
Sissy Pass has played some decent tennis lately. He made the final at the French. So all these guys have had their chance. But to me, the player who has the best opportunity to beat Djokovic and win it this year, it is Sasha Sparev. He's playing the best tennis of his career. His mentality is just different. He's not the fragile little kid that he once was. He had to lose some tough matches. He had to go through some difficult situations to come out on the other side. And beating him at the Olympics, then winning that gold medal, winning the Cincinnati 1000 major, he's had the greatest stretch of his career so far. And we'll see if he can continue that. But looking ahead, after beating Sisyvas, beating Andrei Rublev, the Russian who beat Daniil Medvedev in the other semifinal, I, I look at the, the biggest storyline for the U.S. Open to me is who will play Djokovic in the final? I'm already penciling him in. But when, the, the most interesting thing will be when the draw comes out because Medvedev will likely be the number two seed, so he'll be on the other side of the bracket. But does Zverev end up in a semifinal position against Djokovic? Would he only face him in the final? That's what you got to hope for. But to break through and to really be at you've beaten the big three, you put your name on the map, you have to beat Djokovic. You can't be a team and beat Zverev. You're not. You're you're a phony. Del Potro beat Roger Federer at the US Open. That that's got credence. Um, Murray beat Djokovic, beat Federer at majors. That's why he was given more respect than any other man on tour because he beat the big three multiple times. And that's why he's regarded as such a a great champion, even though he's only got three or four majors, but he beat the big three to win them at least. He didn't beat Robin Sorling or, you know, player to be named later to win his major. And we'll we'll see what happens. A good Cincinnati event code, a couple weeks of tennis, but the U.S. Open will start on Monday with – we see the men's and women's draw, but Thursday or Friday, we should see the draw come out and say who will be playing uh, against who down the stretch here. Um, just checking in here on the Northern Trust. Uh, John Rom still has a two stroke lead. Tony Fino, yeah, everybody's trailing by a couple strokes. Uh, looks like it's just reading this a tough round for. For Jordan Speed, he had back-to-back triple bogeys. He had an eight over for, on the day. Uh, he shot, I believe, four over on Saturday. So a real tough break for Jordan Speed this week at the Northern Trust. Um, I was going to talk about NFL I might for a minute, but I also wanted to pass on condolences to former NHLer Jimmy Hayes. Uh, Jimmy was a member of the Detroit Red Wings organization, the Florida Panthers. Uh, I believe he had a cup of coffee with the Boston Bruins. And he passed away this morning at the age of 31. And I haven't heard as the reason or the cause of death yet, but I know he had two young children. He had a wife. I spent six years in the NHL bouncing around, but only 31 years old. He's the brother of Kevin Hayes who plays for the Philadelphia Flyers and just terrible news. Um, He, uh, all accounts we've seen multiple people tweet out that he's just a fantastic guy, including Ryan Whitney talking about how they, you know, just playing golf last week. Um, I remember him being a great competitor, a guy who wasn't afraid to mix it up. He was kind of a depth guy, but you know, just condolences to the Hayes family. Um, Obviously, you know, gone way, way too soon. Uh, I, I really hope it wasn't something um, where I, I'm not going to speculate about the death, but I hope uh, it, it wasn't anything too, too graphic for the family with the young children, but just hope they can get through this um, and, and that, uh, you know, that they're okay. But uh, condolences to Jimmy Hayes and former, uh, you know, an NHL alumni and just hope everybody can can battle through today is also Kobe Bryant's birthday. Um, he obviously passed away a few years ago, but, uh, it just makes you think, 
know, Kobe was an icon in the NBA, a five-time NBA champion. And he, another guy gone too soon, dying in the helicopter accident with his daughter, Gigi, and a slew of other um, families where they were flying to her high school basketball game. They uh, entitled, they got some turbulence and some fog and the helicopter ended up crashing and killing everyone on board. Um, but Kobe's an icon of the NBA. Just seeing his birthday today, um, obviously tough, you know, a tough news, tough to see that, you know, you want to, he was such a great player and he was such a good ambassador for the game because he just loved it. I look at Kobe Bryant, similar to Peyton Manning in the NFL, where Peyton Manning had a great speech at the Hall of Fame, where he just said, I, you know, we need to keep people playing this great game because it's, it's, it meant so much to me. And you know, every pass, every down means something. I believe Kobe Bean Bryant was the same way, where he was a Michael Jordan disciple, where he was a stone cold killer. He would get the basketball and he would take on anybody. He would say, you want to play one-on-one? I will destroy you. And nine times out of 10, he did. And, you know, he beat the Pistons. He beat the Celtics in, in 2010. He, he went through some difficult teams. He played uh, with Shaquille O'Neal. But just looking, he passed away on January 26, 2020. So, you know, it, it's just crazy. He was only 42 years old. Uh, would have been 44 um, today. And uh, just tough news for him. Uh, to, you know, to, I mean, uh, it's been the past, but just it, it's tough news for everybody just to see. You know, he would have been 44. He had a 15. He had multiple children, you know, a great wife, a great life. You know, he was enjoying coaching his daughter. And um, a couple of tough stories to see today. But I thought it was important to bring them up because it it's um they're important uh, and uh, I I just you know rest in peace to him and also to Jimmy Hayes today because that's you know not easy to go through and hopefully um, that the family can get over this um, sooner rather than later of course and in in all all in due time. Um, the NFL, obviously, uh, we got preseason football. Um, don't want to go too deep into that. Uh, uh, I did watch quite a bit of it over the weekend. Shocked to nobody. You know, the rookie quarterbacks all looked pretty good. I thought Zach Wilson looked really good for the Jets on Saturday against Green Bay. Went nine for 11, 128 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, so, you know, really, really the narrative right now is that every rookie quarterback should be starting. And to me, there's two no-brainers. Zach Wilson and Trevor Lawrence will be starting for the New York Jets and the Jacksonville Jaguars week one. The big question marks will is, will Justin Fields for Chicago? I don't think he will. If I was the coach, if I was Matt Nagy, if I'm Ryan Pace, he's starting for me because he gives me a better chance to win than Andy Dalton. Now, do they have a great offensive line? No, and he got smoke pretty good but he stayed in the game he's a tough kid we've seen that and i i just think obviously Nagy and pace are desperate they know they need to have a good season or they're going to be fired and you don't want to kill a kid's career but i just i look at it and say you have a better chance to win with with him and it's not like they don't have anybody to throw to david montgomery is a good back you got alan robinson jimmy graham can still play cole Komet is a player. We've seen them with Jesse James. They have a connection. So they're not devoid of talent. Their defense is still very good with Akeem Hicks and Khalil Mack and Eddie Jackson on the back end. So could the O-line be better? Absolutely. You know, they're going to have to hope that Jason Peters, who they just signed, the future Hall of Famer, can solidify that left side. But um, Justin Fields has legs. He can scramble. Andy Dalton does run, but he's more of a stationary quarterback and I think he'll be under more trouble week one the Bears play the Los Angeles Rams Los Angeles Rams have one of the best defenses in the NFL you're gonna have Aaron Donald Leonard Floyd coming at Andy Dalton that's not gonna be good 
Uh, and I, I like Justin Fields' chances. Of, that's Sunday night football, week one, Bears at Rams at SoFi. I like Justin Fields' chances of getting that win a hell of a lot more than Andy Dalton. Um, there's also Trey Lance, who had his ups and downs last night in the game against the Chargers. Uh, I think that I'm honestly leaning towards saying that he's going to be the starting quarterback over Andy Dalton. Uh, sorry, over uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, because I think Kyle Shanahan likes Trey Lance more. Obviously, he does. He took him third, third overall pick. He's got a big arm. I think he's got a lot of skill. We haven't seen him run a lot of the football yet, which I think they're trying to hide his skill set here in the preseason, which I totally understand. But Garoppolo is what he is. He, he's gone out of favor in San Francisco through injuries and, you know, missing Emmanuel Sanders in the Super Bowl on that deep ball where that would have sealed the game. I just think they're done with him and they want to move on to bigger and better things. And to me, that's Trey Lance. And if I had to guess, I think he will start week one. I think he'll start over Jimmy G and I wouldn't, I don't think that's a bad decision. He hasn't played a lot of football in the past year and change, but you know, throw him to the fire and see what you, San Francisco this year, their goal is to make the playoffs. You're in the toughest division with the Rams, with Arizona, with Seattle, you're going to have to be good off the top. And Trey Lance, I think, gives them a better chance to be a good team from day one more than Jimmy Garoppolo does. And finally, there's Mac Jones. I give Mac Jones the least likely chance of starting because I think Cam Newton played well in the preseason, as I mentioned last week. And I just think Belichick will see Mac Jones this year, but it won't be week one because he likes his veteran quarterbacks and I think he'll make Cam sit there. Uh, sorry, Max sit there and wait for Cam to make mistake, and then he capitalize and take that starting job and run with it. But we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, there's also the Denver quarterback battle. Will be Teddy Bridgewater, Drew Locke that should be named later this week. How is Dak Prescott feeling? So there's going to be some more football podcasts. Adam Beers, Matt Wright will be on the show sooner rather than later as the season gets closer. The last preseason games are this week. There is a game tonight between Saints and Jaguars, so we'll get to see Trevor Lawrence play. And also, who's going to be the starting quarterback for the Saints, Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill? It's a 9 o'clock start, so that should be another interesting game as well tonight, uh, some preseason action between the Jags and Saints. A lot, you know, a lot happened this weekend. We'll have more all week. I think it's going to be a really, uh, really good week to talk it over. But we'll update you on the on the golf. Who ends up winning Northern Trust? John Rahm is now 18 under. Cam Smith, two strokes back after eight. He's 16 under for the tournament. So we'll give you guys an update on that. We'll preview the BMW later in the week. And, you know, including the CFL news. Uh, so a lot to get to later in the week, but we will get there uh, when we can. So as always, thank you guys for the support. Always appreciate it. Have a great Monday, and I'll be back tomorrow with Seamus to talk Breaking Bad. We'll talk then.